Bruce has worked with the Sierra Club for 40 years this April. He started as a regional Sierra Club organizer in the Northern Rocky Mountains and Northern Plains states and has served as a national field director and later as national conservation director. He has been involved in designing and implementing campaigns to get off fossil fuels and promote smart energy solutions, preserve our wild America, and support safe, healthy communities at the local, state, regional, federal, and international levels. Bruce has served on the Environmental Support Center Board of Directors, the U.S. Department of Energy Environmental <coughs> Advisory Board, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency National Advisory Council on Sustainable Economies. He is presently a member of the World Commission on Protected Areas. Prior to joining the Sierra Club staff, he was field editor of High Country News, an environmental news magazine covering the West, and was an environmental consultant drafting federal environmental impact statements. He received a bachelor's degree in wildlife biology and natural resources administration from Colorado State University. Please welcome Bruce Hamilton. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Um, what a beautiful place. Glad to be here. Uh, I think it's, um, I think it's uh, apropos that you're here given the what's going on in our country and, and what's going on with the environment. And I really consider ourselves lucky to have you here in this place now uh, for us to have a, a conversation. Um, but before, I want you to know you a little bit. What, uh, how did you, well, come this April will be your 40th anniversary with the Sierra Club, which is, congratulations. Um, what, uh, how did your career with the Sierra Club start? Well, it started as a volunteer. Uh, in this country, we have a thing called military brats, which are basically people who grew up on military bases and then went into the military. I'm an environmental brat. <laughs> My dad taught forest ecology at Cornell University. And so I grew up right next to the National Laboratory of Ornithology at Sapsucker Woods. So I had lots of birds right in my backyard, went camping, went canoeing, spent every summer up in the Adirondack Mountains in northern New York where my dad taught forestry school and I'd go off canoeing and get into trouble. And uh, so I always kind of had it in my blood, but it took me a while to find my way. I started out in school thinking I wanted to be a marine biologist and actually worked for a Scripps Institute of Oceanography down in La Jolla briefly. And, did some oceanographic work down in the South Pacific and decided that really wasn't where it was at. I wanted to be terrestrial. Got into wildlife biology, which is why I ended up going to Fort Collins, because that's where they teach people how to figure out birds and bugs and fish and elk and bison and things like that. And it was a beautiful place to live in. Um, <clears throat> I didn't want to go work for a federal agency, which is what most people do with a wildlife degree. They go and work for a game and fish department or whatever, and they learn how to grow more deer so more people can hunt deer or grow more fish so people can catch more fish or grow more trees so you can cut down trees. That really wasn't what I wanted to do. I was interested in conservation and preservation and protection. And so my degree only helped so much. Pretty soon I could figure out what the names of all the trees and all the birds were, but how do you actually get into advocacy? So I started out just by writing articles. I would learn about something. I was an environmental consultant. What that meant is that whenever they wanted to build a big project, build a big new ski area, build a big new subdivision, build a big reservoir on a river, you know, they would hire people like myself to go out and figure out how damaging was this going to be and how could you possibly mitigate it to avoid big impacts on yeah. wildlife. The problem with that is that I would go figure it out. I'd explain to them everything they ought to do and why they shouldn't build a project and why they should mitigate it. And they said, thank you very much, and they paid me, and then they went and built it anyway. Built a project, right. So I, that wasn't very satisfying, so I started taking all the data that I'd learned and started writing articles to alert the public to what was going on, which was very satisfying for me, but my employer didn't think much of it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so th that career didn't last long. <laughs> Which is why I got into journalism, but it was environmental journalism. And so I was writing about everything going on, but I wanted to be more on the front lines. So when a job opened up with a Sierra Club, and I became sort of the first person in the Northern Rockies at that time, and they basically wanted to pay me in order to go fight coal-fired power plants and fight dams on wild rivers and fight coyote killing and wolf killing. And it was right up my alley. Right. 
you know, what a dream job to have somebody pay you to what you always wanted to do. Right. So I started there, and pretty soon the Sierra Club was growing, and they needed managers to manage all these organizers, and so I became the first field director, but in order to do that, I had to move to San Francisco. So we moved down in 83 after 10 years in Wyoming. But I still miss Wyoming. I still go back every year. It's my favorite place to fly fish and backpack and yes. uh, to get my batteries recharged. I mean, they actually still have real snow instead of Sierra cement to ski on. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of real wildlife that is native. And, you, know, you can still find, I mean, all of the pre-Columbian wildlife is still in that greater Yellowstone ecosystem where I used to live. So here it's just remnants. And you know, you have a couple of California condors still hanging on in the Lost Padres. But up in Yellowstone, it's still got bison and wolves right. and wolverines and yeah. grizzly bears and yeah. it's everything that was there in pre Columbian times. And so it's a it's kinda like the Alaska of the lower forty eight. You don't find that anywhere else in the lower forty eight states. Yeah. And it was my job to try to keep it that way, to keep Wyoming, Wyoming. It's just wonderful to have an organization that'll pay you to do that. What um, what's your job now? Can you talk a little bit about what 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 is the role of the deputy executive director for the Sierra Club? Well, they have this uh, management philosophy in the United States that's called the Peter Principle, which is basically that you keep getting promoted until you're at your level of incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I felt at some point I was getting stale in the jobs I was doing, so I was field director for ten years, and then. When the job came up to become conservation director, I applied for that and I was promoted. Uh, this deputy uh, executive director is basically serving at the whim of the executive director. I decided I didn't want to manage the whole organization, but people asked me to apply for the job. I don't like management that much. And so what I do is special projects. So it all depends on what's happening. I was in charge of developing a strategic plan for the Sierra Right now, I'm head of a civil disobedience task force. So the Sierra Club has in its bylaws that we only use all legal means. And so technically, you can't participate in civil disobedience in the name of the Sierra Club. You can do it as an individual. But uh, given the trying times we have and the uh, people that are now in charge of this country, we feel that civil disobedience is a tool that probably needs to be in the Sierra Club toolkit. So I'm in charge of running a process to consult with the volunteers and the board and try to bring forward a proposal about how one would do it without creating huge risk and liability. I mean, we have a thing called the Sierra Student Coalition where junior high and high school kids can set up their own Sierra Club chapters and go act in the name of the Sierra Club. Well, the last thing I need is if they all decide to do civil disobedience, you know, they go and get their heads beat in, right. you know, protesting in Standing Rock, and then right. their parents sue us. So, right. you know, there's certain things one needs to do. So, you know, you say, well, are we going to allow minors to do this? Right. So, you know, that's a job I'm doing right now. Right. But, you know, each six months, it's something new. Right. And I've never been bored a day in my life in the Sierra Club. Right. Because there's always some new challenge. I yeah. mean, we had to... we came up with a whole strategy about what we were going to do when Hillary Clinton won the presidency. Yeah. And I was in charge of a transition task force I was busy trying to think about all the new initiatives we were going to put on her plate, how we were going to make her the climate champion, what were the next million acres of national monuments that she was going to establish. And then November happened, and suddenly all that four months of effort, you know, who did we want her to appoint in her cabinet? Right. So that right. was all set up and then all thrown in the trash bin. Right. And then we had to remake it, which was the next thing I was put in charge of. So I'm in the transition task force now, which is how do we go fight this new Supreme Court nominee? And how do we avoid you know, mass exodus from the Environmental Protection Agency and being taken over by people that want to destroy the agency? So I don't know what the next thing will be, and it's one of the reasons that I stay on. Yeah. It's just exciting work that is ever-challenging, and you know, the club is nimble enough that it's constantly remaking itself. I can't think of a decade when we were doing the same things, ran the same campaigns, used the same tactics. You know, one time, you know, it was a matter of just getting 10 letters into a congressman, and that was the way you lobbied. Yeah. Then pretty soon you would flood their fax machines. Well, who uses fax machines anymore? 
you know, and then you turn around and say, oh, let's get a bunch of emails, and yeah. now people discount the emails. Yeah. You know, so what is the next tools that we're going to be using uh, in order to try to influence public policy and to engage people? We also found out that originally it was sufficient just to organize Sierra Club members. And at that time, you know, we maybe only had 300,000 members, but nobody else was being very active, so in fact, just organizing those Sierra Club people and telling them to go do something was sufficient to create public policy. Yeah. Then we realized, no, actually, we need an environmental movement. And so then we're busy trying to get all the hunters and anglers and all the wildlife federation people and the Audubon people and Sierra. And then we realized the environmental community is not enough. That we've got to have a far bigger firm. So how do we then reach out to others who so are dealing with labor, we're dealing with Latinos, we're dealing with women's groups? How do you get the soccer moms involved? And so you're trying to build this big movement. I'm going to stop you there for a sec because I want to go to um, the beginning and we get to that seminal. Those, I want to talk about a few of those seminal moments of this transition okay. and uh, the seminal moments where you were your most nimble as an organization in transitioning. Uh, we are going to show one of the things that, you know, the foundation of, of your organization is getting people outdoors and in love with the environment. And uh, I want to show a quick video um, about um, uh, what you guys do with the outdoors. Okay. How you guys get people excited to protect and get involved. <laughs> Sierra Club is known for its outings. A great number of our members became members when they first joined an outing of a Sierra Club. I went on a trip in 1978 to the Wind River Mountains and I met a couple there and became friends with and they said, why don't you sleep out with us one night? And it had never occurred to me not to sleep in a tent, crazy enough as that is. And so I did, I slept out, and I remember that first night sleeping under the stars, and it was a life-changing experience for me, actually, and something that I value to the extreme to this day. In my childhood, we would take, every Sunday, we would take a, a walk through, through the forest, and in the springtime, there was an old huckleberry tree that we would go and visit, and we would go back there every Sunday and uh, pick huckleberries and just wander through the forest as a family. And my father would teach us about some plants, would teach us about some of the animals, and how um, plants and animals interact with each other, and about the importance of maintaining a balance. When I got out of the Army, I moved back in with my parents, went through a divorce, uh, was really depressed, hit, hit some really rough patches uh, transitioning into the civilian world. I moved out here to California, and the access to nature is just limitless. Uh, and I found myself going up to Desolation Wilderness with my dog and just putting a heavy pack on and walking, pitching camp wherever we saw fit. I think it's a place where I really got to process my, my experiences in the military, really got to, got to get out of my own head. So I had a really seminal experience when I was in graduate school. I took a fellow graduate student camping for her first time when she was 23 years old, and it opened a whole new world to her. So that really got me to think, you know, Sierra Club's tagline is explore, enjoy, protect. You can't protect things you don't know. So, you know, as an outings leader, we help so many people make and build that connection to the outdoors so that they can be inspired to protect. John Muir's idea that if you just brought people out into the wilderness, they would feel the power of that environment and they would do everything they could to protect it so that it was there for them to enjoy, it was there for their children to enjoy, for their neighbors to enjoy, and to feel that grounding and the excitement of being outdoors and out someplace wild. My favorite little spot when I grew up is no longer there. And so I really would like to try to preserve and protect as many of other people's favorite spots. Outings will save the planet because it gets people in touch with where they are and it inspires you to have your voice heard, to be part of the decision-making process, to not let somebody take it away from you.
1892, the Sierra Club was founded. Um, what are the seminal moments in its history that has gotten us to, you started to go into that, to an organization that started to protect uh, the Sierra Mountains and, and John Muir's passion for that, to the breadth of <coughs> environmental and social justice issues here. Are there a few seminal moments where you're along this path and you just went, this is the right, this is the moment where we are now going to do this. We have to do this. Okay. Well, uh, 125 years of history. And you don't have to go through minutes. all of it. <laughs> you don't have to go through all of it. I mean, seminal no. moments. Yeah. Like, is there a crystallized moment? Yeah. And maybe yeah. there's not. So it starts out as this California hiking court. And the idea is let's go take people to the Sierra Nevada. When they get to know it, then they'll want to do some stuff to help protect it, which is why the Sierra Club fought and ultimately protected Yosemite National Park and Kings Canyon National Park, things like that. That's kind of the first 40 years worth of effort. We you know, keep getting more members and as a result keep getting more national parks, primarily in California. You know, Eventually, a bunch of California expats that knew the Sierra Club start moving to other parts of the country and they said, hey, why can't I start a Sierra Club in Colorado or in Washington State? And so we start getting these scattered little pockets of Sierra Club people, but it's still not a national organization that has chapters in every state and a lot of political muscle. And it's largely outings, but periodically it's rallying in order to go do some kind of major advocacy on behalf of something that is threatened. Because you take an outing and then suddenly you find a big sign saying you're about to open a mine here or open a logging operation here. And you realize you've got to stop the explore and joy and start the protect mode. Yeah. Um, seminal moment happens post World War II. So a bunch of the Sierra Club people, they have learned how to uh, rock climb, they've learned how to mountaineer ski, and the US Army knows nothing about that. And they're fighting a war with the Nazis and the Italians in the Italian Alps. And so the Sierra Club basically takes their rock climbing and mountaineering experience, takes it to the Army, and they start the 10th Mountain Division, which was all Sierra Club expats teaching people these alpine skills so that then they could go over and actually win back Italy and ultimately help win World War II. There's still the 10th Mountain Division operating in the Persian Gulf now, but not a lot of mountains there. Um, so, you know, that's kind of a key moment. Yeah. People come back from there. And the Sierra Club decides that we've grown to a point where we actually need professional staff. We've had no staff up until 1950 to 1892. And so one of the returning veterans is a guy named David Brower. And they hire him to be the first executive director. Great. There are no staff that he manages. <laughs> right. They keep all the Sierra Club membership on index cards in a shoebox. Yeah. You know, this is very rudimentary organization. But Dave Brower is this amazing visionary. I mean, he ultimately was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, but he is probably the most influential environmentalist of the 20th century worldwide. Uh, he founded the Sierra Club, then he founded the uh, Friends of the Earth, then he founded Earth Island Institute. Yeah. He's just constantly growing and expanding his vision of what we ought to do. So he starts getting fascinated with campaigns far beyond California. And the first big battle he chooses is they want to go build a dam in Dinosaur National Monument. This okay. is the late 1950s. Dinosaur National Monument is part of the national parks. The Sierra Club under John Muir had a big fight when they wanted to build Hetch Hetchy Hetch Dam in the middle yeah. of Yosemite. We lost that one. Dave Brower says, not on my watch. We aren't going to lose another national park to a dam. This is sacred ground. Not going to happen. So he starts a national campaign bringing reporters out there, floating down the river with it, talking to people, lobbying. And suddenly, there is this movement all across. The first time there ever is a book on a conservation battle called This is Dinosaur that's put together. The first time he takes his home movies around and uses that as an organizing tool. Nobody had ever been doing campaigning before yeah. at this kind of level. We managed to stop the dam in Dinosaur. So then they turn around and say, oh, well, can't have any dams there. Let's go put them in the Grand Canyon. Not in the park proper, but just upstream right. in right. the larger area that would have basically stopped the water and the sand flow going through the Grand Canyon. 
So again, Dave Brower says, not on my watch. And he tackles the entire Western water culture. For the first time ever, he runs full page ads in the New York Times. This is a beautiful tactic he had, where they've never done this before. So he has these little clip coupons. And they had argued that, oh, gee, if we could just build a reservoir in the Grand Canyon, then the water would be high, and then all the people could come in on their motorboats, and they could enjoy the Grand Canyon more, because they could be closer to the walls. And Dave Brower said, what in the world is this about? Why don't we just flood the Sistine Chapel so that people can get closer to the ceiling? And this was the ad, and it just sparked the imagination of the whole country. And it turned out that ultimately, the Bureau of Reclamation canceled the projects, and the Sierra Club was on the national stage. But in the process, then, people started getting more and more Sierra Clubs all across the country, because they yeah. said, you know, it's nice to have these other conservation groups, but they aren't kick-ass flutes. Yeah. Now, the thing that happened, and this is the next key moment, yeah. we're now into the 1960s. Sierra Club is so successful in challenging the federal government and stopping these dams that President Kennedy and President Johnson, two Democrats, who wanted those dams, because their Secretary of Interior, Stuart Udall, came from Arizona and wanted those dams. They sick the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, on the Sierra Club. And they say, you are a 501c3 charitable organization, but you're spending too much time lobbying and giving us pain in the ass. So we're going to strip you of your tax deductible status. And they did. So we got a letter from the IRS, which transformed the Sierra Club. So no longer were we going to be a mealy mouth, pleasant, sit yeah. back, yeah. and just ask people pretty please will you not save this area. Right. But it was actually a blessing in disguise to become a non-deductible C4 organization. So we're still a non-profit. Right. But if you join the Sierra Club, your dues, you don't get a tax deduction on it because we're going right. to use it to go hammer politicians. Right. The other beauty of that is it turned around and it enabled us to get involved electorally. So here's the next big shift. Come early 1970s, we decide we're going to venture into electoral politics. No conservation group had ever done this before. Right. We're going to endorse candidates. We're going to get people out on the streets because our champions are getting defeated. Right. And they're saying, it's very nice of you to come in and ask me for my vote, but I need your vote. What are you doing each November yeah. to make sure that I get reelected and that I don't have right-wing people knocking me out of office? Yeah. It's hard to take these votes for you. You've got to do something for me. And so we created this political action committee, Sierra Club Political Committee, and basically that was the next big thing. Yep. We're still primarily middle class, primarily well-educated, and almost exclusively white, as was the entire environmental movement. Yep. Even with the first Earth Day, 1970, when we had this massive turnout if you look at that first Earth Day, it's all monochromatic. It's all white people turning out talking about clean air and clean water. Yeah. When in fact we all need clean air and clean water. But we hadn't reached out to the other communities. And so starting in the 1980s, we started tepidly getting involved in what we called environmental justice. And environmental justice was saying, we've made a serious mistake. We have actually been promoting environmental racism. Every time we turn around and try to stop a landfill or a toxic waste dump, you know, or a major subdivision in an area that we care about because it's got nice wildlife potential or it's one of the areas we like to recreate in, yeah. what do they do with the project? They don't kill it. They just turn around and put it in a low-income community. And they suffer that. Those fence line communities are basically getting worse pollution, and it's at the expense of... <laughs> Uh, and partially because of the inaction of the Sierra Club, where sometimes we were actually working on the other side. How, how did you guys hold up that mirror and make that reflection? I mean, was it obvious? It was shoved in our face. Yeah. So there was a first People of Color Summit, yep. and the People of Color Summit all got together, and they basically issued a challenge out to all the major green environmental groups, the Environmental yep. Defense Fund, NRDC, yep. you know, Sierra Club, Audubon. They said, all you guys are involved in environmental racism. racism. All of you people are not part of the problem. You don't have any people of color on your board of directors. You don't have yeah. any people of color on your staff. Yeah. You know, and you're basically just running white campaigns to protect polar bears. And in the meantime, you know, we are part of the environment too. Right. 
and our basic purpose said that we were supposed to be, you know, protecting the natural and human environment. Yeah. But in fact, we weren't doing much about the human environment. We yeah. didn't really have an inner city urban program. Yeah. And so some people took up the challenge, like the Sierra Club, and said, we've got to do better. Yeah. So, you know, we basically urged that there be a hostile takeover of the Sierra Club, or a friendly takeover of the Sierra yeah. Club, whatever. Said, please join. When was that? Eh, early 80s. I mean, this has kind of evolved. In the yeah. meantime, we decided that we were going to start hiring people of color organizers to work in fence line communities, yeah. but not in the name of the Sierra Club. I mean, they would be our employees, we would hire them, but you weren't supposed to go out there and determine what is the issue, what is the outcome, and get the Sierra Club's name in the paper. Yeah. Instead, the idea was, we're here to assist you. So if you're the you know, East Angeles Mothers for Clean Air, yeah. you know, you're going to be the front. What yeah. do you need? Yeah. You know, if you need some help with your communications and media strategy, we'll provide that. If you want some help with your organizing strategy, we'll provide that. If you want some help with your fundraising strategy, we'll provide that. But we're here to serve you. You determine the issues, you determine the outcome, and hopefully through that we build enough trust that ultimately people will come around and say, hey, that's Sierra Club. It's really doing some good stuff. Maybe I'll also join that organization. But the idea wasn't to initially say, you've got to become a <coughs> member of the Sierra Club or else right. we aren't going to help you. Can you can you share with with us a little bit about making tough choices? And there's only so many so much resources you guys have. There's only so much you can do. Talk a little bit about how you guys uh, allocate your resources and and support what you guys um, are most passionate about. And how do you make that choice? Yeah. And and when and one of those things or when do you, when do these things butt up against each other and you kind of go. You know, what do you do in that moment of uh, friction and you have to make a choice? Yeah. Um, let me just finish one thought you on finish, the prior thing and then I'm going to switch to that. And that is, you know, the environmental justice, uh, helping fence line communities and providing organizers to assist them was just the first phase. We're now involved in movement building where we're trying to figure out how to make sure that when we have action together, uh, to resist the Trump administration or to promote uh, a climate movement, that it not just be the Sierra Club and the environmental groups, but that we have labor, we have people of color, we have everybody there, and we jointly determine the strategies. We jointly determine the outcomes. We make it a point that it's not just the Sierra Club up on the podium speaking to the crowd, yeah. and you know the Native Americans are there as window dressing. Right. You know, they determine what they want to do on Standing Rock. Yeah. They're the speakers. They're the ones that we help get into the Oval Office, but then they go meet with the president in the Oval Office. Yeah. It's not the Sierra Club speaking on their behalf. And by building trust and building a movement this way, so now we require every one of our employees, they have to have a justice and equity component in their workplace. Every campaign that we run, whether it's a wilderness campaign or a defeat a coal-fired power plant campaign or a campaign to clean up toxic waste dump has to have a justice and equity component. And you have to go talk to the affected communities ahead of time and figure out how to build that broader movement yeah. ahead of time. Yeah. And that's the latest new revolutionary part of the Sierra Club, which I think is frankly what's going to help us prevail over these most difficult times that we now face. Because, you know, Donald Trump can blow off so many environmentalists and just say, oh, you guys are just a bunch of you know, tree huggers and polar bear lovers. But suddenly when it is all these people all across rural and urban America, red and blue states, that are all rising up in arms, saying enough is enough, you know, we need clean air, we need clean water, we didn't vote for this, that's what's going to actually bring them to their, either their senses or their knees. Now, your other question. Friction. Friction, conflict, what do you do? I mean, I just ran. How do you guys make your yeah, decisions. We just ran a priorities process through the Sierra Club, where you know everybody didn't get. We came down with seven priorities for the Sierra Club, mm -hmm. which is hard, you know, because it's not a matter of sort of saying, well, is work on gender equity and trade and you know wilderness and wild rivers and coal-fired power plants and you know on and on and on. You know, you could easily come up with 
a thousand things the Sierra Club does. Matter of fact, I tell people that I don't even know what goes on in the Sierra Club. If I knew everything going on in the Sierra Club, not enough would be going on. So it's perfectly fine for a local chapter or a local group to have their own priorities. But when we're looking at the national organization and what are the few big rocks that we've got to push up that hill in order to succeed, yep. we've got to make some very tough choices. So we looked post-election and we said, how do we operate in this hostile environment? And we said the opportunity to actually pass positive legislation in the Congress is zero. The opportunity to actually get the White House or the federal agencies to go do our bidding, as we were sometimes successful in doing with the Obama administration, is zero. zero. We still have some opportunities in the courts, because they can't go replace all these judges. Most of them are in there with lifetime appointments at the federal district court level or circuit court or even on the Supreme Court. So we still have some ability to stop them. So even though Donald Trump says, I'm going to go ram through the can't sell tar sands pipeline or the Dakota access line through Standing Rock, they can't just do that tomorrow. It's not as simple as Donald Trump putting his name on a piece of paper that's stuffed in front of his nose that he doesn't even know what it says. But in fact, it requires them going through a process. And one can tie them up in knots with that process. So part of our priority right now says that we want to hold on to the basic fundamental laws that allow us to act on behalf of protecting people's lives and their neighborhoods and the natural environment. So we don't want to lose the basic authority that is under the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act yeah. or the Endangered Species Act. So that's kind of job one. Yeah. We aren't going to turn around and try to get another million acres of wilderness, even right. though some people want us to do that. Ain't going to happen. Right. But if we can hold on to the Wilderness Act so that it's there, when we ultimately discredit this administration and this Congress and get a more favorable forum, we want to be there to do that. Right. So that's one thing, is hold on to that. Two is the place where we can still make lots of progress is at the state and local level. Yep. But Donald Trump can say all he wants to about how he's going to revive the coal industry and take us back into the 18th century. But frankly, he can't do that. It is transforming because of basic economics. Solar and wind is cheaper than coal. And there's certain standards that are required for coal-fired power plants to meet. And they're all aging dinosaurs that need to be retired. And we can challenge them one by one by one at the State Public Utilities Commission, you know, in front of the city council. And Donald Trump doesn't have any power there. Right. So if the citizens rise up and say, we want this plant shut down, <coughs> Donald Trump can't say, no, I want to keep the jobs. You know, people are being poisoned by those plants. Yeah. So the other thing we said, we're going to put a bunch of money into going and keeping progress. So we have sort of a resist component, which is stop the bad things from getting worse and taking away the basic authority. Yeah. And then there is a sort of win sustain, which is basically being held at the local level. The other two key components of our strategy are called recruit. Yeah. And recruit basically just means build a movement. I mean, sure, we'd love to, and we will probably end up doubling the size of the Sierra Club. But that's really not the goal. The goal is to have a movement. Yes. Sure, we want to have you know, 4 million members instead of 2.8 million. But it's more important to have 12 million people out there ready to take action and hold these people accountable. And yeah. if they're all filing lawsuits, they're all standing in the way of the bulldozers. You know, they're all going to the voting booth. Yeah. I mean, there's off-year elections next year in New Jersey and Virginia. We've got to go win those right. and let people know that there isn't any mandate. People didn't vote for this dismantling of basic environmental protections and yeah. civil rights and immigrant rights and everything else. And the way you do that is by, you know, getting people awake and then turning around and changing the dynamics so you build back up again. We talked about one of your programs that <clears throat> as we have a video for. Um, uh, called Ready for 100%, which sounds like one of these mm -hmm. uh, initiatives that won out. Rich?
many of these uh, how many of these cities have gone 100 percent? If you have cities that have already committed to 100 percent, yeah. So it's everything from little enclaves like say Aspen or Boulder, Colorado, yep. to big things like San Diego, yeah. You know, St. Petersburg, Florida, you know, Chicago. So you know, there's ways that one can turn this around. So again, even though you look at the electoral map and you say there's these red states and there's these blue states. There's a bunch of blue cities within red states. Sure. And there's a bunch of... Uh, it's not just a Republican or a Democratic thing. You look at no, it's not. Lancaster, <laughs> California, Republican mayor. And that Republican mayor championed legislation that said no new construction can happen in my city unless it's got solar collectors on the roof. Yes. Yeah. That, that's the kind of way that you turn around and transform an economy. And so this is the way we continue to make progress. You know, people are worried about, oh my God, the United States is going to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement. And in fact, that would be terrible. Yes. But we can't require Trump to come to his senses and stay in there. What you can do is keep on the track so that you're still reducing carbon emissions in this country, regardless of whether you're in the climate agreement or not. And in fact, if we continue to transform the economy and to keep increasing the amount of renewable clean energy we've got in this country, at the same time shuttering and shutting down all these dirty fossil fuel plants and dirty fuel pipelines and everything, we will stay on a track. And so, you know, that's the plan we have there and what Ready for 100 is about. To basically say, any city can do this. You don't have to be Sierra Club, but you know, if we have a local Sierra Club, they'll be in the forefront of it. Yeah. And we'll give you an organizer, and you basically go get your city council to commit to this. There's also a thing called community aggregated power. The community aggregated power basically says, instead of buying your power from Southern California Edison, which might have a bunch of dirty gas plants, or might even be importing some coal-fired power plants from uh, Arizona, you know, instead, the city will contract for only 100% clean energy for all the consumers within that municipal jurisdiction. Yeah. So they've done that in Marin. They've done that in San Francisco. We're about to do it in the East Bay for Oakland and Berkeley. Um, you know, it's a growing movement. PG&E is fighting it in Sacramento. But it can happen. Ojai can do it. Uh -huh. Santa Barbara can do it. Yeah. And you ought to get ready for 100. Um, the school watched before the flood last week. Um, Michael Brune was was involved in that, and then Sierra Club helped out. That what was their role in, in helping create that documentary? Well, Leo DiCaprio is this great actor, but also great environmentalist. Um, we actually took him up to the Canadian tar sands. Yeah. So a bunch of that footage there mm -hmm. was on a trip he took with Michael Brune, and then when he became this UN ambassador, I don't know how long that will last. I don't think. Nikki Haley is going to let Leo DiCaprio you know, <laughs> argue for climate change, but you know she also is the Secretary General, so maybe I can yeah. just reach over her arm and keep him in that role. But regardless, um, he's very dedicated to this. Uh, you can see he was on a mission to go learn more, and so he's busy going and talking to everybody. We told him some places to go talk, but yeah. other ones he had on his own. Yeah, and then he pulled it together into a beautiful thing, and then. Part of what the Sierra Club can do is then figure out how to make it go viral so that uh, people can download it and yeah. have little house parties. And yeah. as a result, more people get see this. It. So you don't necessarily just go into a movie theater and see it. Right. That's not the distribution plan they had. Right. You know, when, when Inconvenient Truth came out the first time, you know, it hit the movies and you know got masked. Awesome. Well, there's the sequel to Inconvenient Truth that's going to be airing next week. Okay. But again, you aren't going to go find it in a movie theater, probably. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, there's just new ways that these things need to get distributed. And the Sierra Club needs to figure out how to sort of get that happening and then show up at those theaters and then tell people, don't just go in and see this and then go home and read your hands. But here's some postcards. Yeah. Here's the action you can take locally to follow up on this because we can't let Trump determine what our climate policy is. Uh, the one section, the one piece of the documentary that I found really, really fascinating was um, speaking with um, the, the one silver bullet and the, I think he, I don't know if he was a Republican. I think he was a Republican. I don't know if he was an economist, maybe. I can't remember if he was. Either way, he talked about carbon tax. And he said that that is the silver bullet. Is that unanimously 
the nope. solution? Okay. Nope. So what do you think? Well, Bill McKibben likes to say there is no such thing as a silver bullet. There's only silver buckshot. Okay. <laughs> and that <laughs> you, need, you need a price on carbon, and that will do some things, but it doesn't do everything. And particularly if it's one of these revenue neutral things, which is how they want to sell it to Republicans, which yeah. is basically you go tax carbon, and then you turn around and take all the revenue you've got there and basically rebate it to people. Yeah. And as a result, there's no money to actually go do anything else with it. And yet we have need for a major revenue source to accomplish a number of justice and equity things. That US pollution over the last 80 years has basically led to the change in the global climate so that we have climate refugees now. So that people from the Maldives or wherever, you know, their countries are disappearing. And they need some mitigation. And big polluting countries like the United States need to be providing money to them so that they can either build higher sea level walls or you know, move to New Zealand as some of them are doing, or you know, whatever it is. But we are at fault. We need to try to figure out how to fix that. Yeah. If we're going to insist that a poorer country like India not continue to build more and more coal-fired power plants, and even though we shut ours down, if they're building more than we're retiring, it's still one big atmosphere in the globe. Yeah. So how can India leapfrog? You know, a lot of people don't even have electricity. You don't want to say, keep in the dark ages and keep burning dung in your house, you know, and have the indoor air pollution. You know, we're going to deny you having a refrigerator and an air conditioner, right. but you can power it with clean power or you can power it with dirty fossil fuel, right. but you need to leapfrog the industrial revolution and dirty fossil fuel resources and go straight to clean power. Yeah. How do they do that? You've got to give them some money. And so if we take all the money from the carbon tax and just turn around and rebate it back to U.S. consumers, then you don't have money to do those kind of things. You need to pay for retraining the coal miners that are going to lose their jobs. We have a just transition. Got to have some money for that. You need to make sure that clean cars are not just available to yuppies that can buy Priuses and Teslas, but how do poor people avoid getting out of their gas guzzlers yeah. and getting into an all-electric vehicle and becoming part of the clean energy economy? Yeah. So how do you have enough money for that kind of stuff? So it's important to have a revenue source, price on carbon. You don't distribute it all. Some of it can go back to consumers, but some need to happen to these other things. You also need a big regulatory program. You can't just turn around and say, you can buy a right to pollute. You also need to say, no, you just can't pollute. So you know, if it's too expensive to clean up your dirty coal-fired power plant, so you can just buy some credit somewhere else and plant some trees in Honduras or Guatemala, you know. That's great, but the people living next to that power plant are still breathing that toxic air and have horrendous asthma and health problems. And so you've got to shut them down. You can't just shut them down with a carbon tax. Right. It, it seemed like too simple of an answer when I was watching it. And I really appreciate your answer because I assumed it was yeah. way more bold. Than well, just you know, the Citizen Climate Lobby is great. They promote this as the solution. I promote it as a solution. Yeah, yeah. But I don't disparage them. I say, Good, let's everybody co-sponsor that, go pass it, but don't forget to continue to push on all the other fronts because we need buckshot, not bullet. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask one more question and then I, I need to leave time for, Please. Uh, for questions. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I gotta choose which one I wanna ask. Because I got ready. Uh, I wanna ask you about um, Six days ago, and oh, not six days ago, two days ago, and the executive director said, <laughs> "I should know this." <laughs> well, he said, uh, "Mike Green was quoted yesterday. It was actually it was yesterday in the USA Today article. President Trump lived to regret his actions this morning, promising a wall of resistance the likes of which he's never imagined." And I thought that was a pretty, hmm. uh, very stern, very clear statement about um, the Keystone and the current pipelines. Briefly, describe the, what the pipelines are in case someone does not know what they are. And then second, what is that wall of, what does that wall of resistance look like? Yeah. So the Keystone XL pipeline basically takes the dirtiest fuel on the planet, Canadian tar sands, from Fort McMurray, Alberta, 
and tries to bring it all the way down across Canada, all the way through the central part of the United States to the Gulf of Mexico, at which point it's then exported. You know, this is not fueling America, you know, safe, secure oil instead of Arab oil. This is basically an export scheme, so the oil and gas industry is going to be busy. Tar sands is the dirtiest fuel on the planet. If you were to turn around and develop all that tar sands, you basically would nullify all the work that we've been doing in this country. All the coal-fired power plants that we're shutting down, all the natural gas power plants we're shutting down, if they develop and burn all this tar sands that they want to do and export it to Asia and export it to Europe or export it to the United States. They can still do that if they have this pipeline. Well, this is one of the many pipelines they're trying to do. They have pipelines that they're proposing to the west coast yeah. of Canada that the First Nations are blocking. Yeah. This is the big enchilada as far as what's coming through the United States that we can fight. Yeah. But the wall of resistance is not just the Sierra Club hoping to go back to court. Yeah. You know, they basically have to condemn private land all along the route. The Nebraska farmers don't want this. The Native Americans don't want this. The local communities don't want this. Every time there's a river crossing, people are concerned about it. So the wall of resistance are people all along the pipeline route that are prepared to stop this at all costs. You know, the Sierra Club, for the first time in its history, participated in civil disobedience by our executive, Michael Bruton, getting uh, arrested, arrested by being chained to the White House fence to sh demonstrate how important this was to us and to tell President Obama that he had to take action and stop this. You know, the steady protest that led Obama from being a supporter of the pipeline to ultimately killing it is the same kind of thing that we've got to do. I don't believe that Trump on his own will kill this. And that took seven, seven years of yep. debate, discernment. Yep. How, how in six days can we then reverse that? Well, he can't build this in six days. He can't get permission to build this in six days. You know, right now, Dakota, excuse me, the KXL, Trans Canada, the promoters of that pipeline, haven't even reapplied for a permit because they withdrew the whole thing when Obama killed it all. And they just said, we'll take our marble and go somewhere else. So what was he signing? He was signing, he was signing something saying, federal agencies, I'm directing you to expedite review Got following it. all legal means in order to make sure that these pipelines are ultimately built. Got it. Now, those agencies that are required to go do that still don't really work for you. So the Corps of Engineers has to grant a permit for the other pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline, to go under Lake Oahu, where Standing Rock Sioux and 100 uh, Native American tribes are busy trying to blockade it. Yeah. They're in the middle of writing an environmental impact statement. The Corps of Engineers is committed to write that environmental impact statement. He can tell them, oh, I want you to expedite this, but he had, you can't just turn around and say, oh, now we aren't writing the environmental impact statement. If they do, we'll haul their ass to court. This could take years. You know, if we lose at the district court level, we then go to the circuit court level, we then go to the Supreme Court. How many years does that eat up? And in the meantime, hopefully, they are building this thing. So that's the wall of resistance. You basically look at every possible avenue you have to throw a roadblock and a monkey wrench in this whole thing. Got it. If it requires civil disobedience, so be it. If it requires, uh, you know, it's just like when all the veterans showed up to support the tribes there. I mean, that was completely out of the blue. Yeah. And yet, you know, there was, you know, suddenly all these folks saying, we're with you. Yeah. We've screwed you over for 200 years. Now it's our turn to give back to you. Yeah. And they're breaking treaty rights. I mean, those tribes are ready to go to court, too. All right, questions? <coughs> anyway. Yes, sir. So I know that Trump has said something to the effect of a black border on all sort of government related research. And I'm just wondering, you know, being, being some sort of disseminated platform. So I'm wondering, how does that impact you? Does it impact? I think it is going to be a wonderful era for leaks. I think it's going to be a wonderful era for whistleblowers. Uh, you know, it's just like right now, the Washington press corps is being uh, urged to not go to White House briefings because all they do is get fed, spoon fed alternative time. facts. <laughs> <laughs> And in fact, if they would actually go out and do real journalism by talking to people in the agencies off the record, 
they could find out what's really going on instead of having Kellyanne Conway tell them a bunch of bullshit. And, that, and actually have something to say, something yeah. to write about, it, yeah. content. So uh, it's going to set us back because we can't make as much progress as we need to make. You know, we aren't going to see the basic research being done by the federal government because they're going to stymie that. We aren't going to see the research that is already common knowledge and accepted by the rest of the world disseminated by our federal agencies. But there's plenty of other places to get that information and get it out and around. I and mean, if you listen to Governor Jerry Brown's State of the State speech just two days ago, I mean, it's just an act of resistance and defiance. And he says, if you're taking down the climate satellite so you aren't gathering data anymore, we're going to shoot up our own satellite. Yeah. You know, if you're going to turn around and squash science, we're going to urge the scientists just to come to us and we'll turn around and disseminate. You know, there are federal research labs, like the Lawrence Livermore Lab, you know, that get federal dollars right now. You know, Trump may try to go cut off all those dollars, but those scientists can still get funded by other means and turn around and continue to do good science and get it out there. And ultimately, hopefully, true facts will trump <laughs> alternative <laughs> reality. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, if you think of lithium batteries, sure, lithium is a rare earth, but it's relatively common at this point. We don't have, I mean, uh, there's a group called Earthworks in Oakland that are basically uh, the main leaders all around the world in trying to figure out how to stop the worst kind of mining. And I've been talking to them about the minerals that go into batteries and whether or not, you know, we're basically sacrificing Bolivia or the Gobi Desert in order to, you know, have fancy cars. And, you know, they've said that there's enough places where there's lithium where there's relatively minimal environmental damage that, in fact, this is a good solution. And when you consider the overall impact of remaining on fossil fuels, it's far better. I don't know long term. I mean, ultimately, if we had more compact cities, more reliance on mass transit, more walkable cities, bullet trains, you know, then we need, I mean, you know, individual passenger cars are not ultimately the solution for humanity. Can solar help with that? Pardon me? Can solar help with that? I don't know about solar cars. I mean, you know, you, people put panels on them and they can drive all the way across the country, but um, I just think that, <clears throat> you know, if you have a solar panel on your roof and you then turn around and charge your car, 100% electric car, and drive it around, it's being solar powered. Yes, the battery, you know, comes from lithium. And, but, you know, as long as they keep developing better and better batteries that last longer and longer so we aren't throwing them away, and hopefully eventually we can try to figure out some different substitute minerals or whatever it is, you know, maybe ultimately you can throw it out of seaweed. I don't know. I mean, we've got to count, <laughs> count on new technologies continuing to arrive. Um, but for right now, electric cars, good. Uh, hybrid electrics, you know, slightly worse, but still good. Yeah. Hybrid gas cars with no electricity, still much better. Questions? Over here. Darcy. Um, I think Colorado and Utah have established offices of outdoor recreation. flat-footed. I've never heard of these offices, but I'm, as I said, if I knew everything, not enough would be going on. I mean, my initial thought is that 
Colorado and Utah, you know, have this huge ski industry that they uh, depend on and want to encourage and promote. And so that's probably why they've established this. You know, our economy is much more diverse. I mean, our ski industry is nowhere near as big and nowhere near the same percentage of the economy. Whether we had an office of outdoor recreation advocacy or not, I don't think would be the beginning or end of the world. It wouldn't be my first priority for California. I mean, frankly, we can't even fund our state parks so that they're shuttered and don't have any naturalist interpretation and, uh, you know, they're falling apart with infrastructure, you know, don't have, you know, adequate water and half the bathrooms are shut. And, you know, let's go fix that before we turn around and, you know, have some office of outdoor recreation. Um, as far as selling the public lands, it ain't going to happen. You know, Donald Trump uh, didn't advocate that himself. It was in the Republican Party national platform. The person that he has selected to be his Secretary of Interior, Ryan Zinke from Montana, basically pledged in front of the Congress in his confirmation hearings that he would not push that. That he said it was a mistake and that he felt that the federal government should maintain its limits. So I think it is a pipe dream of a bunch of uh, right-wing ranchers and miners and loggers that think this would be a wonderful thing. I mean, you know, they've had studies showing that Utah could afford to take over the public lands. You know, so they aren't, you know, I mean, they passed resolutions in their state legislature, but if they ever actually got stuck with a bill, they basically have to shutter the whole thing. You know, it's not a matter of money making where you can just sell so much oil and gas off the federal lands it'll pay for everything. You know, they don't want to charge these guys to exploit. You know, so it's it, it not what keeps me awake at night. It's what we send out alerts on because it's red meat to our membership. But they think, oh my God, you know, they're going to sell off the national parks. But they aren't going to sell off the national parks. And they're going to do it over my dead body if they do. <laughs> right. Todd? Um. It's been kind of my observation that one of the really big elephants in the room in terms of environmental law um, is that corporations um, are constitutionally protected um, in the same way that we as individuals are constitutionally protected. And, and nature has no such rights. Um, and I've, I've been curious as to whether there's any momentum or movement towards um, creating some constitutional rights for, for nature. Uh, because it seems like we can prolong um, the efforts of corporations to, you know, to utilize the natural resources of the planet. Um, but ultimately, um, they're constitutionally protected to do so. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if the Sierra Club has sort of been thinking on those terms at all in terms of um, creating a mechanism for giving nature rights in, in a similar way that we have rights. Well, there's a great model out there, and it's South Africa post-Mandela. You know, the South African Constitution basically establishes the rights of nature and the right to every South African citizen to enjoy clean air and clean water and a healthy environment. Uh, same thing true in Bhutan. So why in the world we can't do it in the United States, I don't know. I mean, there periodically is talk of this, um, but we actually have pretty darn good uh, set of environmental statutes on the books and the ability of citizens to sue in order to go defend nature. That if somebody wants to go log an area or mine an area or, you know, spew a bunch of pollution out, you don't have to rely on the Constitution, but you can rely on the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the National Forest Management Act and the National Environmental Policy Act and lots of other stuff to basically tie them up in knots. And in that sense, you know, our panoply of environmental laws is kind of the envy of the rest of the world. You know, the Canadians don't have anything like this. The Europeans don't have anything like this. They don't need tools to be able to. Yeah, as many tools. Yeah. And these are things that have been built up over time. I mean, I don't know if you folks saw this wonderful PBS show last night of Rachel Carson. Anyway, if you get a chance, download it and see it. It's a, it was just released on the American Experience last night, two-hour show on Rachel Carson. But she basically transformed the whole thinking about, you know, how 
corporations ought to be held accountable. That you know, before this, you know, people were just saying, "Oh, don't worry, you know, there's no problem with that." And she turned around and said, "No, there's a huge problem, and we need to expose that." This was over DDT and pesticides, and she wrote this book called *Silent Spring*, which basically changed the whole dynamic about citizens holding corporations and government accountable and sharing information and not just relying on corporations to say, don't worry, everything will be just fine. There was just this little old lady writing books. And, you know, she's one of the heroes of the planet. As far as I'm okay, concerned. time for one more question. Dave. Yeah, I, I, I have a question. Um, is there a way for uh, students of, say, our school's age to actively get involved like are the youth chapters, or is it more like they have to get involved individually? And I would say what I would add to that: what is, are other leadership and intern opportunities? Okay, okay, okay. First, regardless of whether you start a Sierra Club student arm here or not, or sign up for a Sierra Club membership or not, go to SierraClub.org/resist. It is a way that you can participate online, and every day there's stuff that you can do. And so if you want to know the latest thing, this is just an online community that's available to anybody. We have, it's also available at add up slash resist. And add up is basically our environmental Facebook kind of thing. You can go in there, create your own campaigns to run, <coughs> or find somebody else's campaign. You get feedback on, oh gee, you're the 8,345th person to sign this petition. Here's what's just happened on that, and here's the next thing you do. Well, here's the next thing if you care about doing it. If you are interested in the Sierra Student Coalition, um, then you can uh, contact me at the Sierra Club, Bruce.Hamilton at SierraClub.org. I'll put you in touch with the head of the Sierra Student Coalition. And you know whether you're just an individual or you want to get 10 of you together or 50 of you together and have a little chapter, you can do it. You can also just participate as individuals. Uh, you know, it's a student-run you determine your own priorities, you determine your own practices, and uh, you know we just try to give you the skills. You go off to skills training camp and learn how to protest and how to write letters and how to develop a campaign and how to do an online campaign or an on-land campaign. So all those things are available to you. I actually started when I was a student as being a Sierra Club volunteer. There's also local chapters and local groups. So you know there's one in Santa Barbara. I doubt there's anything in Ohio, but there's members in Ohio, And, you know, you can sign up for them, get their newsletter, they run outings, they run campaigns, and you can figure out how to go help save the Las Padres Forest from oil and gas development. Please do. <laughs> Bruce, thank you so much for being here today. Really okay. Thank you. I just want to thank all of you. Uh, you know, I'm not going to last forever, and the sooner you can kick me out of my job and take over, <laughs> the better. Uh, there are intern opportunities. I mean, not for everyone. They're competitive, but, you know, every one of our offices, if the right person has the skills and the interest and the communication ability and is showing they're dedicated, uh, we're glad to put you to work. We have them in D.C., we got them in Oakland, we got them 90 offices scattered around the country. Thank you. We also have a little uh, Besson Hill goodie bag for you. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Please. So we don't have time for music today. So at the end, if you're a visitor for our assembly for the first time, at the end of our assemblies, we always have a reading and a moment of silence. So and music as well. But you know, since we don't have time to we'll go straight to the reading, which Kevin will do, we'll have our silence and then go off to sports and fitness. So thank you again for joining. Walk away quietly in any direction and taste the freedom of the mountaineer. Camp out amongst the grasses and gentles of glacial meadows, me meadows and cagey garden nooks full of nature's darlings. Climb the mountains to get their good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into the trees. The winds will blow their own freshness into you, you and the storm the winds will blow their own freshness into you and the storms their energy, while cares will drop off like autumn leaves. As age comes on, 
One source of enjoyment after another is closed, but nature's source never fails. John York.